Welcome to this side event, the Munich Security Index highlights and views from behind the scenes. As an essential part of the new Munich Security Report, the MSC and KEXT CNC together have published the second edition of the Munich Security Index, a data set on global risk perceptions, analyzing 31 core, core global and domestic risks. Based on a survey conducted among 12,000 people globally, the index provides an in-depth view of how G7 and BRICS countries view risk in 2021. My name is Natalie Knapp, and I'm speaking today with Tom Lubbock and James Johnson from KEX CNC, who were the driving forces on the side of KEX CNC. And we are joined by Sophie Eisentraut, who is head of research and publications at the MSC, author and member of the editorial team for the Munich Security Index. Welcome. Thank you. Let's start with our first question. Tom, what is the Munich Security Index and why do we need an annual index of risk perception? Thanks, Natalie. Um, the index, as you say, captures what the public think about different risks facing the world. And really, it allows us to rank how the public see these different risks. And we get to find out whether they share the views of the attendees of the conference to what do they think are the top risks and which risks do they think are on the rise and which risks do the public think are not ones that we should be taking too seriously at the moment. And why is it important? Well, there are three reasons. The first is that we should get a read on exactly what the public do think about all these risks rather than trying to guess or rely on uh, received wisdom about what those risks are. The second reason is because we need to really um, uh, get a handle on the ranking of those risks. So um, it's easy to think the public think that uh, Russia is presenting an increased risk or that global warming is a risk, but our index allows us to actually say, here's the top risk, here's the second risk, and here's the r exact ranking of those risks. And really the third reason is to look beyond the, the immediate crises that we may face on whatever given week it is, whatever's on the front pages, at the moment, and the public have slightly longer time horizons to see what's rising up the um, list of risks and to, as I say, get a longer time horizon, a longer perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at the core of the index is a risk heat map uh, with the final risk index scores for each country and each individual risk. Uh, James, how do you arrive at this heat map and how can it be used? Yeah, so what we're doing for the behind the scenes of the risk index to get to those final scores is we're looking at a measure of things. We're not just going in there and saying, you know, uh, do you think this is a big risk? Do you think this is a small risk? We're asking people to measure their view on the imminence of the risk. So when they think it's going to happen, we're asking them to measure how serious it would be if it did happen. Uh, and we're also asking them that sort of overall uh, view of, of, how, of how serious it might be as well. Uh, we're putting that together with a couple of other inputs, and basically that gets us our final score. And we end up in this world where we now see climate change as being the major uh, global risk, the pandemic falling back slightly. Um, but as you say, being able to see that picture across, across all 12 of those nations that we've surveyed. So let's take a closer look at the results. Sophie, what are the most important findings of the MSI? Yes, thank you, Natalie. I think one of the most important findings of this second edition of the Munich Security Index is that um, concern about risk has increased overall quite a bit. So that means for almost all of the countries that were surveyed, so the 12 BRICS and the 12 countries BRICS and uh, G7, um, and for almost all of the risks that were covered, we see a rise in concern about these risks. And actually, the most um, significant um, rise in concern has been witnessed in Germany. And I think the, the second uh, interesting finding is um, related to the um, topic of this year's Munich Security Conference and also the uh, topic of the Munich Security Report that was published on Monday, um, which is uh, the topic of helplessness. And we see in the index that actually um, in all of the countries surveyed, majorities feel helpless in the face of global events um, and feel that their countries lack control over the development of these global events. Um, it's either relative majorities or in some countries even absolute majorities. And what we found particularly striking is that uh, democracies were particularly um, 
concerned, particularly helpless mm -hmm. um, compared to non-democratic countries. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some risks that are prominently debated at the moment and what the index tells us about them. Uh, Sophie, could you comment on the risk COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes, um, I think the risk posed by the pandemic is a very interesting case because we've seen that while it was still a top concern when the uh, last wave of research was conducted in uh, February and March, um, it has um, moved down in the, in the ranking compared to other risks. Uh, and that's both the case for the coronavirus pandemic, um, but also the case for a future pandemic. Um, so part of the reason might, of course, be that polling took place in November. There was a time when um, many of the countries that were surveyed were not yet struck as badly by either the Delta or the Omicron variant. So maybe polling a few weeks later would have already delivered somewhat a different result. Um, but even if the pandemic moved down in uh, relative terms uh, compared to other risks, we see that people are still uh, very worried about, um, about the pandemic. For instance, when, when asked whether they believe that uh, over the course of the next year, they think that uh, the risk of the COVID pandemic will either decrease or increase uh, or stay the same, the majorities everywhere said that they expect the risk to uh, increase actually and I think that's that's interesting when we see a lot of um, decision makers at the moment already with a lot of hope of course announcing that uh, that maybe the pandemic is is over soon um, or the worst of it uh, it seems like the publics are not as convinced uh, of that just just to add briefly to that point from Sophie is that that point Sophie made about the future pandemic you know the risk of a future pandemic is also going down and that's a real challenge for policymakers because you know there's no guarantee that there's going to be a pandemic once every hundred years you know we may have been lucky in, in having such a long horizon uh, span between uh, the two biggest sort of pandemics to hit to hit the world. So, you know, policymakers have a narrowing window, we seem to be being told by this polling. And if you want to sort of warn and get messages out there about future pandemic preparedness, then it looks like it's going to be something to really sort of focus on now rather than in a, a few years' time. The public are listening now and might not be listening later. That's an interesting point. Thanks, James. Uh, you already mentioned climate change. Could you comment on risk perceptions around climate change? Yeah, we've seen, well, the public are incredibly um, uh, well, well versed in the risk of climate change now. Um, there was this uh, perception a few years ago um, over the last, say, decade that the public didn't take climate change as seriously um, as they should. Well, we see in the risk index this year that climate change in its various forms, whether it's extreme weather or, the, or climate change in a more abstract concept, are the top risks and the public really have got a handle on the fact that this is the greatest risk facing the planet. And so it's a, it's a positive story in that respect. The downside and the thing that um, the Munich Security Report really highlights this year is that there is a certain amount of helplessness. About, we saw about 40%, um, about four in 10 people feel that they just are completely helpless in terms of climate change. Um, and, it, and so that is a call to policymakers. That finding is a call to policymakers to actually give people positive actions they can take to overcome this helplessness. And we think that if they do that, people will grab that. The, the index shows they will grab that opportunity with both hands. Let us look at two <laughs> countries uh, currently in the debate. Uh, Sophie, can you comment on Russia? and how it's being perceived by the people polled? Um, yes, uh, I think Russia is one of the cases where we see very nicely that real world political events are reflected uh, in, the, in the data, in the um, opinions of, of uh, the societies surveyed. Um, for instance, with regard to, to Russia, we, we clearly see that um, the perceived risk posed by Russia has increased overall. Um, and more so for Russia than for other countries where you might have expected the same thing for China, for instance. Um, the perceived risk um, has increased the most in, in Germany and in Italy. Um, and I think that, that does reflect very well the recent developments that we're witnessing right now. 
Uh, you just mentioned China. Maybe one of you, Tom or James, could give a few more details on that. Yeah, so when we look globally at where people rate, rate risks, China is in 10th place. So it's in that top, top 10. Uh, it's certainly the biggest threat that anybody sees from a global, from a global power. Um, the, the views in early 2021, when we first did the survey, um, actually showed quite a division between countries in how much they saw a risk from China. That has become slightly more uniform. So risk gone up a bit, but it's also become more even across the, across the West. The difficulty, though, and the difference, and I suppose the challenge posed by, for the global community from the Munich Security Index findings on China, are that there is a big, there's a big difference in terms of how people think their country should approach China. You end up with basically three buckets. You end up with one group of countries, uh, sort of uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, um, who are in the world of support China economically and support China, uh, cooperate with China militarily. Then you end up with the complete flip. You end up with the US, Canada, uh, and Japan, who are basically saying oppose China economically and oppose China militarily. I suppose you'd call those the sort of the China hawks amongst the public. And then you end up with this middle group who basically say, Yes, if push comes to shove and in preparation uh, for uh, any sort of, uh, in terms of armament or military preparations, oppose China militarily, but support them, cooperate with them economically. And that's where the UK, France, Italy and Germany sit. And that's really the sort of the world of fragmentation, I suppose, and difference that we have uh, in the Western democracies in terms of the approach to China. And as I say, that's really going to sort of, you know, I suppose, be the key question of how those attitudes shift over the next few years. You polled 12,000 people in 12 countries. Uh, James, can you describe some of the challenges of polling such a diverse set of countries? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that you obviously have to do is translate the survey to make sure that it's in the right language in each market. But not just literal translations. We need to make sure that actually, uh, you know, the meaning is conveyed properly and that we're really getting across the right thing to the right respondents. In each country, we've surveyed 1,000 in each, so uh, we obviously have to make sure that the sample is representative, that it's representative in terms of age, gender, region, all of those usual questions uh, in polling. One of the difficulties, of course, is polling in countries like Russia and China, um, which may not view opinion polling in quite the same open way uh, as some of those other uh, democratic countries. And that's where we do have to caveat some of the data from those countries, because uh, you know, we've seen in, 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 in the data any poll of China Chinese uh, public very positive about their government. Now, that may be real. It's also obviously in a context of quite a different uh, system of government uh, to ours uh, uh, here. So some caveats there. Uh, but broadly speaking, we've got a, we think we've got a pretty uh, robust set of data. And it's really those comparisons between them all that, that brings that through the m most strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the results, Tom, from your experience, uh, would you say that the public are good or bad predictor of global risks? Yeah, it's a really good question. And one which I guess um, is at the heart of how useful the index can be. And I think it depends what the risks are. We talked about this earlier, and there were really two kinds of risks that the public are good at, are good at judging. On the one hand, there's the ones that they've been um, soaked in for a very long time. So where they've had time to absorb the facts and really form an opinion and receive good cues on those risks. And climate change is the archetypal example of that. The second kind of risks are the kind of risks to the nation state. So um, if you're in Japan, China's a great risk. Um, those kind of risks, the public are good at judging them and uh, understand them. In the middle, there is clearly a group of risks where the public uh, have views which I'm sure would uh, alarm the attendees at the Munich Security Conference in that the public do not see uh, lots and lots of uh, things as, as great dangers that perhaps attendees at the conference would think we should be paying attention to. But this is the great thing about the index. This is the great challenge that leaders have to engage with their publics. You have to understand where the public are and go to them and lead them from, where, from the starting point of where they actually are at the moment. If you want the public to be concerned about a future pandemic, as James says, you have to meet them on their own terms. You can't uh, artificially create a concern about a particular issue just when you need the public to act. You have to lay the groundwork and you have to actually engage with public. So this is really at the heart of why the Munich Security Index is completely uh, vital to what the Munich mm -hmm. Security Report does. And just, just, very, just very briefly to add on that, you know, if you'd have 
built your picture of risk just from polling over the last uh, mm. 10 years. Um, I think I think a poll uh, in about 2018 had the risk of a pandemic sort of below 10%. So, you know, it wouldn't have been the yeah. best thing just to go for public opinion data. But as Tom says, as with all polling and with the Munich, Munich Security Index, yes, it's about knowing when to sort of follow the public and when to be aware of their concerns. But it's also about where to lead them. And that's where, you know, it's so important to get this this in front of policymakers as well as the other way around. Mm. So let's take a look at the decision makers. So which main findings should they consider? I guess from my point of view, um, if decision uh, if decision makers are involved politically, there's one really big takeaway and a quite surprising one from this year's um, Munich Security Index. And it's the rise of Uh, the concerns about supply chains and inflation, which we measure in a risk called food shortages. And really, even in Western uh, countries, even in the UK, in Germany, in the US, ordinary people are getting concerned about the risk of food shortages. Now, this isn't uh, a concern which would boil down to I don't have enough to eat, but clearly they are. people are concerned that supermarket shelves are either not going to be stocked or stocked with things that are too expensive for them to buy. And if you're a decision maker, this is going to be something which dominates the next kind of uh, at least year of your um, of your time. So that's one that I would highlight. James? Yeah, I think I think certainly uh, on, on the food shortages, I think we also see uh, a really interesting one in the current in the context of the current uh, situation in Ukraine um, that shows quite a lot of skepticism from a lot of the public about military intervention, but also about the idea, also about how close an ally they view Ukraine. It's quite interesting. They overwhelmingly in most of these Western countries view uh, Russia as a threat and Ukraine as an ally. But it's not the overwhelming, you know, sort of uh, warmth towards Ukraine that you might expect from having a look at, you know, the polarization of the debate in the newspapers. You only have sort of about people by about a margin of 10 points or so saying that Ukraine is more of an ally than a threat. Uh, and actually over the last year, You, the number of people who view Ukraine as a threat has, has moved in that same amount as, as, as the amount of people who view Russia as a threat. So, you know, we see sort of a, a more nuanced picture, I suppose, than you might expect uh, from where the elites are. And I suppose that's a message of, you know, as we move towards, um, you know, a potential situation of conflict, as we move towards a situation of the freezing of, of, of international relations, politicians are going to have to bring their public on board as well. So, you know, there is a persuasion campaign and a, an outreach campaign for those leaders to bear in mind as well. This is like the second edition of the Munich Security Index. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the differences to the first, uh, first edition or uh, interesting findings that appeared in the second edition? Should I go first? Uh, yeah. I, think, I think the first thing to say, so basically what we're doing here is the Munich Security Index 2022 is from a survey taking place in November 2021. And that shows change in earlier in the year. And the dramatic amount of change actually in that period is really quite striking. We've seen, as Sophie said, a rise in risk across the board. We've seen that concern rising. I think all but about four of the risks have actually, all but four of the risks have seen an increase in how uh, endangered people feel uh, about those things. Uh, the big mover and shaker is climate change. That's gone up even more so over the last uh, year. We've seen the pandemic receding slightly. Um, and we still see those great power risks, China and uh, Russia um, having a big influence. Uh, concern about Russia on the rise, concern about China becoming more uniform too. What's also interesting is where things haven't changed. And the, two, the top risk in France last year was uh, radical Islamist terrorism. That remains the case, the only country where that's the top risk. And the top risk in India is the threat of nuclear attack. And that also remains the same compared to earlier in 2021. So although we have some stark changes, including that rise in food shortages and the risk of inflation, we also see some things staying stable as well. But there's absolutely no doubt from this research uh, that uh, we are looking at a much more, uh, a world that looks a lot more besieged by risk than it did a year ago. A world that looks, feels a lot more helpless in the face of that risk. Uh, and a world that is increasingly not feeling prepared for the risks ahead. I can't say we can claim that this is the most optimistic report in the world. It is a pretty bleak picture in terms of the situation the public see. Let me just add uh, one more thing, which is that there are countries which are risk up and countries which are risk down, mostly, as Sophie said, risk up. And really just to highlight um, the increased concern about risks in Germany. Across the board, Germans are more concerned about climate change Um, 
about their security. And really, it's a, it's a, Germany is the country that has seen the largest increase. Even after the federal elections had taken place, there is a general increase in concern in Germany about the risks uh, that they face. Can I just have one more, Natalie, if I may? Just the other thing that the other big mover in the survey is this risk of the breakdown of democracy and the possibility of political violence and even civil mm. war. We've seen, we've seen that go up a bit slightly in France. We've seen it go up in the US amongst Republicans and Democrats evenly. So the other story to all of this is, yes, we've talked about conventional external risks, climate change, China, Russia, but actually there are these internal risks that are growing as well. And I think you know, that fear about political violence, you know, almost half of uh, the French public uh, feel that the civil war or political violence is imminent. I mean, you know, there are some very striking findings for what have been very stable democracies for a long period of time. So there is risk within as well as without. Thank you. Uh, from your perspective, uh, Sophie, what is the most uh, surprising finding of this index? Most surprising? I'm, we also asked um, uh, societies not only about um, views on um, specific issues and uh, risks posed by specific countries, but also um, explicitly asked um, whether they saw specific other countries as more of an ally or more of a threat. Um, James has already mentioned some of the findings with regard to China. Um, but I think what, to, to me at least, was not so much surprising was how much views of Belarus have deteriorated over the, the past year. Um, of course, a, a reaction to um, the brutal repression um, of democratic protesters, uh, protesters in the country. Um, so Belarus is much more viewed um, as a threat now than it was back in February 2021 when the first polling took place. What surprised me, however, was um, that views on, on two other countries also deteriorated um, quite a bit, um, which are Poland and Hungary. Um, so from the view of uh, the NATO countries polled, um, both of these countries are now viewed as um, more of a threat than they were back in uh, early 2021. And I think that um, probably has a lot to do with um, continuing assaults on the rule of law in both countries. So the um, dimension of uh, democracies and values that, that James just mentioned um, also figures in there pretty strongly. Mm -hmm. Any further results you might want to share here? I think one for me is we've talked about the threat that other nations see in regards to Russia. But it's quite interesting, the polling from Russia itself, uh, where we don't see a nation at ease. And I think that as we analyze what's happening in uh, Ukraine and, and in relation to Russia as a whole, it's interesting to see where the public are and what might be informing uh, some of the uh, elite decisions there. The top risk in Russia is rising inequality. Second is, is the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and the third is economic or financial crisis in the country. Uh, those are, it's, it's one of the nations where those economic indicators, those inequality indicators are actually at their highest and they've gone up significantly over the last year. So there's a really sort of interesting picture there where Russia is one of the nations that feels most besieged by risk and may well be informing some of the domestic political situation we see happening as well as the international moves uh, by, by Russia. The other one I wanted to mention was when we zoom out and look at how nations are uh, sort of set to uh, support or, or oppose Russia, um, again, we see a similar picture that we see for China, where we see the nation, nations broadly going into a, a, a three camps, some wanting to support them uh, no matter what, some wanting to uh, oppose Russia militarily and economically. We see the UK, we see Canada, we see the US in that bracket. And then in Europe, we see quite a different picture where we see nations, publics wanting to uh, oppose Russia militarily if it came to it, but still wanting to support Russia economically. And we see that in France, we see that in Germany, and we see that in Italy. And that's really, I think, the key tension at the heart of lot, a lot of the uh, NATO alliance when it comes to the response to Russia, and maybe one of those things that we'll be talking about in the, in, in the coming days and weeks. There is a fundamental difference in how Western publics view how their government should deal with Russia. And the European nations uh, are much less likely to be bullish compared to some of the transatlantic uh, nations such as the UK and the US. Yeah, and on that, I guess it falls to me to talk about US exceptionalism. So the index shows that the US is exceptional in two regards. 
Uh, the first is the top kind of four risks in the US, which are cyber attacks, polarization, economic crisis, and disinformation campaigns. And that's an unusual basket of risks as far as the um, risk index is concerned across uh, all the different markets we surveyed. And the second is in terms of um, political polarization, which is obviously one of the risks itself. But um, Americans are obviously, as you'd expect, polarized on these risks. America is the only country really where there is a significant polarization on climate change, which is obviously the top risk, the most important risk. Um, and so it makes the US a kind of exceptional case. And that's an important takeaway from this year's Munich Security Index. And it's even on you know, things that in other nations, people are looking at from more of an evidence-based position. Mm -hmm. In the US, you end up with a situation where Republicans are much more likely to see uh, Islamist terrorism as a threat than right-wing terrorism. And Democrats are more likely to see right-wing terrorism as a risk than Islamist terrorism. Now, you know, from a sort of a policymaker position, only one of those things can be right, or they're at the same, same level of risk. You know, so the, the politics is informing everything in the US to, a degree that, to the degree that it doesn't in other countries. Maybe one more thing that, that is interesting in the index is that I mean, two years back at the last uh, Munich Security Conference, the last physical one, we talked a lot about westlessness, about um, divisions among the transatlantic partners, but also among Europeans. And we did in the first index um, poll, we also I saw a lot of divisions among European partners when it came to, um, for instance, the threat posed by um, China, um, the threat also posed by Russia. And we saw especially Italy diverging in, in some sense, um, judging um, China to be more of an, um, an ally than a threat to Russia as well. Um, and I think that it's interesting that there are still these divisions. You can still not talk about a coherent Western view or coherent European view. Um, but I think these, um, these gaps have narrowed in, in some way. And that's um, also, it will, will be interesting to, to watch that um, in the next years, whether these, these gaps grow um, still closer. But I think it's interesting to see that there's already um, a change in public opinion with regard to the threat posed by yeah. um, certain countries in this geopolitical competition. Can I add one bit of good news that we found in the survey, uh, <laughs> yes. which is we asked people whether they thought that uh, America was a sort of a more reliable partner or a less reliable partner over the last uh, six months to a year. Um, and we did that in the wake of Afghanistan. Um, and I think probably our hypothesis would have been that we'd have seen a significant worsening of that, of, of that view. Actually, although Americans themselves feel that America has, has perhaps taken a step back, the rest of the world actually has not seen a significant hit to their view of the US. Uh, Japan has actually become more confident in the ability of the US to act on the world stage since early in 2021. Uh, so we're not seeing a complete uh, loss of trust in the, in the transatlantic relationship. And the other thing is democracy. Um, we measure people's support for a, a, a various concepts and ideas, free trade, capitalism, and democracy. And the number of people who say they support democracy, uh, it's 70% across all of these countries, and that has stayed completely stable. Uh, so that's one of the... Uh, few bits of more positive and uplifting news uh, in, in the Munich Security Index. We're not seeing a complete uh, decline or, or change on both views of democracy, but also views of America. Thanks a lot. So let's end this discussion on an optimistic uh, note. Thanks a lot to our experts, Sophie Eisendraut, James Johnson, and Tom Lubbock. Um, please find further information on the index on the conferencing platform or on the MSC and Kext CNC website. Thank you.